This Metallica CD hasn't always been my coffee coaster. Music used to come from it. And for 40 years this summer, that's been the case for hundreds of billions of other compact discs. CD sales actually rose for the first time in nearly two decades in the US last year. Sales of vinyl and cassettes are up too. So it's worth asking on this, the CD's 40th year, whether its glory days are exhausted, or if, as many optimistic quadragenarians believe, life only begins at 40. CDs were developed during the 1970s by Philips and Sony, and the first player went on sale in Japan on October the 1st, 1982. The Sony CDP-101 cost about $1,000, equivalent to around $3,000 today. Consumers were told the convenience and sonic prowess of the all-digital CD made it a no-brainer over bulky vinyl records or fiddly cassette tapes. And not just in homes. Within two years, Sony had released a portable CD player and another that fit in cars. Adoption grew exponentially. In 1984, CDs only accounted for about 2% of recorded music sales in the US. By 1985, it was 9%, and by 1986, it was 20%. But only part of CD's magic had actually been shown off at this point. Consumers had no idea the technology kept a massive secret. That was the fact that CDs weren't invented to just store audio. Not really. They were created to store binary data, which in the first instance were digitized sound recordings. Behind the scenes, engineers were working out how to format computer data for them. Floppy disks at the time stored less than about two megabytes of data, while CDs could store hundreds. Philips and Sony had been working with computing giants, including Apple and Microsoft and others, and the first computer CD-ROMs landed in 1986. CD-ROM quickly took off, much like their Sonic brethren. And much like the first iPhone, CD's successful formula of simplicity and adaptability looked to be unstoppable. Also like the iPhone, experiments with how it could be exploited were routine. Some failed out of the gate, of course. In 1991, Philips released the CDI system. This $800 CD player plugged into televisions rather than hi-fis or PCs, and although it did play music, it also supported interactive video and even games. But CDI cost too much, tried to do too much, and accomplished nothing very well at all. Sony succeeded here where Philips had failed, by putting the technology into something people already knew how to use, games consoles. And in 1995, we got the PlayStation. It could even play audio CDs. And in fact, music for many PlayStation games were stored on the discs as CD audio files. You could literally put them in a hi-fi and play the soundtracks there if you wanted. CDs still hadn't shown off everything they could offer. In 1995 as well, Philips said it had created specifications for a rewritable disc aimed at the corporate market. It had already created blank CDs with Sony that could be written to at home using recordable hi-fi decks or expensive computer drives. At the turn of the millennium, there was still little sign of CD slowing down, even as the internet took off in earnest in homes and campuses and businesses around the world. In the US in 2000, CDs accounted for close to 95% of all recorded music sales. However, Nobody foresaw that CD had an Achilles heel. Students in campuses across the world had learned about Napster at the turn of the millennium, hence the famous lawsuit with Metallica here, and were making bit-perfect copies of each other's music collections in a way neither Sony, Philips, nor any other company responsible for CD's development had anticipated. Before long, the same was happening with software, infinitely replicable with zero data loss, something that could have never happened with vinyl or at the same scale with floppy disks. The lawsuits and plummeting sales of recorded music that resulted from Napster and its copycats are well documented. But while the industry did suffer enormously at the hands of piracy, it also forced the hand of innovation. And the result was iTunes and then Spotify and you know the rest. So 40 years on, is a slight uptick in CD sales indicative of a revival of the format? I'm afraid to say, almost certainly not. At CD's peak, they may not have offered that collectible appeal and beauty of a gatefold vinyl package, but what it gave in sound quality and convenience instead was valued so much that it didn't matter. Magnified by the adoption of CD-ROMs in consoles and PCs, the versatility of what you could do with a CD and where you could do it simply couldn't be competed with. 
Today, that convenience and versatility comes with the internet and apps, while vinyl, which outsold CDs last year, is the experiential, collectible choice for many people. It's big, it's pretty, it's very easy to autograph and lovely to put in a collector's frame. It also still sounds amazing through the right hardware, and it doesn't have the competition now that it had in the 1990s. That's why it's flourishing. The CD is a very special thing, as game-changing as the iPhone, or even the web in many ways. But while it may be enjoying a tiny fling with success on its 40th birthday, it's almost certainly a last hurrah after a lifetime of changing the world. You may have your own memories of CDs or its spiritual kin, the Super Audio CD or Laserdisc or Minidisc. Find me on social media and let's chat about those. For Quick Take in London, I'm Nate Langson and I've been Technically Speaking.